So tonight, it's really a huge pleasure for me to <coughs> welcome Dr. Reza Shah Qasmi back to, to talk to us at the Prince's School. He has lectured to us several times before, I think. We've been extremely fortunate. And he's been so busy writing books in the last 12 years. In the last 12 years, he's actually written nine books. We counted up yesterday. And he doesn't do public speaking <coughs> anymore, so we're, we are very honoured. Dr. Shah Qasmi is a senior research associate at the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London, very close to here. His books are on comparative religion and Islamic studies, including The Other in the Light of the One, which is about the universality of the Quran and interfaith dialogue. One of my favourites, which is his first book, called Paths to Transcendence, according to Shankara, Ibn Arabi, and Meister Eckhart. I, I really recommend this one. Another one which I brought along, which I also, is one of my favourites, Common Ground Between Islam and Buddhism. And perhaps my very favourite, because it's small <laughs> and you can carry it in your pocket. It's a beautiful book called My Mercy Encompasses All about the Qur'an's teaching on compassion, peace, and love. And Dr. al at the moment is working on a volume of collected essays entitled Muslim Reflections on Christian Mysteries, The Incarnation, the Crucifixion, and the Trinity. And finally, with his books, um, his ninth book, which is called Imam Ali and the Triumph of Sanctity, will be published later this year. And I'd like to, to add about Dr. Shah Qasmi is he's a great scholar. Not only is he a great scholar, which he's extremely uh, humble about, but it's characterized by being not simply very um, cerebral or abstract, as many academics are, but is nurtured by deep understanding, knowledge, wisdom and practice. And you will have a taste of that this evening. And also, if you've read, I expect many of you have read Dr. Shah Carlson's abstract of his lecture about Rumi, because he approaches Jalal Adin Rumi from a profound inner perspective and deep understanding of the essential aim of all spiritual journeys that of total self-effacement before God. This indeed is the prerequisite of the friends of God, the saints, as he writes. So maybe this evening we can all try to emulate Rumi's famous nail, his reed flute, and become a little hollow in order to benefit as fully as possible from Dr. Shah Qasmi's knowledge and wisdom. So please welcome Dr. Shah Qasmi. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Princess School, the Princess Foundation, for inviting me to give this evening's lecture, and to thank the Barbary Foundation also for making it possible. And I would have liked to have started the lecture by saying that Rumi is so well known, he needs no introduction. But unfortunately, that's far from the case. He is extremely popular, he's been dubbed the uh, the best-selling poet in the United States recently. But his popularity has been in almost inverse proportion to knowledge about the real Rumi. Not only do we need an introduction, but we also need, very crucially, a context. We need to put Rumi back into his context in order to see more clearly how his message transcends that context. Um, <coughs> The popularity of his work has largely been due to um, modern interpreters of his work, such as the American poet Coleman Barthes, who, although he admits to not knowing Persian directly in his collaboration with Persian speakers, he has managed to rework Rumi and satisfy the spiritual hunger 
of Westerners in a remarkable way. But the price that's been paid for that is that we ignore, marginalize, or minimize to our peril the spiritual, the cultural, the scriptural context within which Rumi's poetry was not so much composed as inspired. We miss a huge amount if we just go to the sort of cherry picking and not see how the ideas and images that Rumi uses are resonant with aspects of Islamic spirituality, the Qur'an, the Holy Prophet, upon whom be peace and blessings, without which the resonance of those ideas will be lost. So part of my task today, this evening, is to uh, put right this error of projecting onto Rumi our own needs or our own understandings. And to quote what he says himself in the very beginning of book one of the, of the Masnavi, everyone became my friend from their own opinion. Not seeking my secrets from within me. So it's too large a task, of course, to try and give in this hour that I have the entire uh, scriptural and prophetic context for his teachings. Um, but I'm very happy to say on that note that um, uh, Mac Media uh, are in the process of putting together a feature film on Rumi. Um, and I've, I felt out of the duty to the legacy of the great man that I should accept the invitation to be an associate producer and consultant to um, Ovidio Salazar, who is uh, we're very fortunate to have with us this evening here, um, to try and put that record straight. And I'm quite sure that the, the film will bring much in the way of light and blessings and true knowledge about the, the inspirational sources of Jalaluddin Rumi. But in tonight's lecture, I'm going to aim to talk about Jalaluddin Rumi's view on the communion of saints. It's a Christian notion that I've borrowed, and I, this notion came to my mind as soon as I read a particular passage to the sort of heart of tonight's lecture, which we'll come to in about 20 minutes or so. Um, I should also say, before we get into the lecture proper, that it's easy to see how Rumi can be taken out of his context. Because his message, as we've got up here now, does appear to fly well beyond the boundaries of formal Islam, of Islam as it's formally and literally, formalistically and legalistically understood. When he says such things as this, the community of love is separate from all religions. For love is the community and the creed is God. Um, he's going to say many things like this in order precisely to undo the excessive, excessive formalization of the spirit of Islam that he saw taking place all around him. But that's a different thing from us taking him out of that context. For us, we need the form in order to get closer to the spirit. So, that Rumi's message, the fact that Rumi's message surpasses religion as normally understood, is, it goes without saying, because he reveals repeatedly and explicitly the fruits of what we could call a supra-confessional spiritual realization, one which goes beyond all confessions and religions. And these fruits will be recognized or rather taste it, whatever be one's religious starting point. He leads us to the summit, in other words, of all religions, and from that point we can see the relativity of religious forms because of the transcendence of this spiritual essence. 
that transcendent spiritual essence he makes somehow imminently accessible to us because he shares the fruits of his vision of transcendence in a way that uh, speaks directly to the imminent reality of that essence in everybody's heart and soul. In our depths, we respond to this message of transcendence precisely because it comes from the heart of his own realization. Del bedel ratarat, it says in Persian. The heart to the heart, there is a way, a path. Hearts speak to hearts. So in the second uh, citation we've got there, he says in one of his poems, this is a quatrain, number 1000, actually, if I put it, no, this is from the Divani Shams. What do you make of this, O Muslims, that I do not know myself? I am not Christian, nor a Jew. I am not a Zoroastrian, nor am I Muslim. He also says, uh, the next one, however, he also says this, I am the servant of the Quran as long as I have life. I am the dust on the path of Muhammad, the chosen one, Muhammad and Mustafa. If anyone quotes anything different from this, from meaning his sayings, I dissociate myself. I, I'm quit of him and I'm outraged by his words. So anyone who takes me, Rumi is saying, out of this context of total submission to the Quran and to the Prophet Muhammad, I have nothing to do with such a person. You have to understand I'm coming from Islam even if my message transcends Islam. There's no contradiction, in other words, between these two points of view. Rumi is revealing some of the deeper ramifications precisely of the spirit of Islam that transcends its own form. This is what one might call a metaphysical implication of Tawheed, the idea not just of oneness, but of affirming and realizing oneness. No God but God, la ilaha illallah, is, a, is affirmed through a series of processes implying ethical, aesthetical, intellectual, cultural and spiritual processes of affirmation. It therefore also implies the essential unity of all of the prophets of God, all the scriptures that God has revealed and all the religious traditions based upon the prophets and those scriptures. As he says in the Masnavi, when you have fled to the Quran of God, you have mingled with the spirit of the prophets, and mingled with Ravana and Biya, all of them. If you go to the Quran, that's what you will encounter, that's what you will receive, the spirit of all of the prophets. The Quran consists of the states of the prophets, Hal Haya Ambiya. Hal is a technical Sufi term, meaning not just a state, but a spiritual state of, of, of consciousness, a sublime, altered state of consciousness, if you like. The fishes of the Holy Tree of Majesty. That's from the Masnavi book, Quan lines 1537 to 1538. In these lines, Rumi tells us something very important, both about the Quran and about the Masnavi. In his own prelude to his poem, which is a remarkable document in its own right, written in Arabic, he says, among other things, that the Masnavi is the kashaf of the Qur'an, which means that which discloses the mystical depths of the Qur'an. And his claim has been substantiated by generations of mystics and scholars, who some of whom go so far following Jami as to say that the Qur'an, that the Masnavi is the Qur'an, in the Persian language. According to basic Islamic belief, the Holy Quran is the speech of God. Rumi adds to this postulate of faith a mystical dimension, saying that this Quran, this speech of God, doesn't only reveal to Tajalli the manifests, the very uh, nature of God, but also the spirit of all of the prophets. Fleeing to the Quran, as he's just said, does not mean imprisoning yourself within the confines of some narrow confessional creed. It rather means mingling with the spirit 
of all the prophets. And now this emphasis on all the prophets are, is um, a conceptual aspect that we can, and I believe should, uh, dis- try and discuss, although the essence of what Rumi is saying is really unfathomable, the idea that the spirit of the prophets is somehow in the Quran. The Quran is the speech of God. The speech of God is not other than the essence of God. The essence of God is giving itself to you all through the spirits of the prophets. All of this really requires deep meditation and is not so easy to explicate on the doctrinal plane. But what can and should be reflected upon conceptually is the fact that the Quran tells us that all of the prophets sent to mankind by God are, in a sense, prophets of Islam, in the sense that no community has been left without a messenger. There are many uh, citations that we could give on this point. Um, Ah, okay. Yeah, so these are just some of the verses that uh, we can look at. I don't need to read all of them out, but this is just a sample um, of one of those unique aspects of the Quranic revelation that uh, all the prophets sent by God to all communities are part of one ummah, one religious community. When one thinks of a country as vast as China and one sees that Lao Tzu and Chang Tzu are not mentioned in the Quran, we can understand that those prophets are almost by definition among the prophets that the Quran mentions because the Quran says, Likulli ummatin rasul, for every religious community there is a prophet. And on the other hand, it says, to the prophet directly about some of the prophets we have told you and about others we have not. So we are invited to use our intellect, our spirit, our sensitivity to the phenomenon of revelation and thereby include in this one ummah, this one global uh, religious community of which the Muslim community in the narrow sense is just one small part. But the whole of the world is the very important verse in the Quran that tells us that the Prophet was only sent as a rahmah to all of the worlds, as a mercy, as a compassion to all of the universes. This universal scope of the last Prophet is matched by the universality of the vision which arises out of a reflection on these sorts of verses. So, well, I'll leave those up while we go on. Um, with this perspective in our minds, we can now turn to the following passage from the Mass Medal. It's a long passage, and it contains a number of crucial themes, which I hope will illuminate some of the key spiritual, metaphysical, and mystical concomitants of Tawheed. Here, the oneness of reality, in this passage we're about to read, is revealed not only through the messages of the prophets in the scriptures and their own sayings, but also through their own metaphysical transparency. They are metaphysically transparent to the God that has sent them, to the one reality of which they are the spokespersons. And here Rumi explicitly affirms the main theme of our uh, lecture tonight, which is the communion of the saints, the oneness of the friends of God. In Arabic and in Persian, one uses the term friend, wali in Arabic, dus or yar in Persian, to talk about the saints. And Rumi is explicitly affirming the oneness of the friends, lowercase f, with the friend, Yar, with God. There's a mystical union as well as a spiritual communion. 
between the saints among themselves and between the saints and God. They each have a mystical union with the friend. The identity of the essence of the friend somehow radiates through the translucent veils constituted by the outward physical forms of the friends of the saints. So this is the passage, and I'll leave it up there. Um, but I will actually read it as well. Inasmuch as God comes not into sight, these prophets are the vicars, Nayeb, of God, Nayeb Ahab. God is invisible, but what makes him and his message visible are these prophets who represent God. And let's remember the etymology of the word vicar, which is related to vicarious, on behalf of. So it's the deputy or the rep representative of God. Then he contradicts himself. Really. Nay, I have said wrongly. For if you suppose that the vicar and he who is represented by the vicar are two, it is bad, not good. I'm making a mistake in, my, in what I've just said. Nay, they are two, the vicar, the one who sent the vicar, they are two only so long as you are a worshipper of form. Surat parast. You're worshipping the surah, the form. And that makes you think that there are two. They have become one to him who has escaped from form. As surat verast. If ten lamps, this is a very, very beautiful and powerful image. If ten lamps are present in one place, remember the lamps that he's talking about, I just have to add candles, or wax, lamps are present in one place, each differs in form from the other. You can see ten different lamps. But to distinguish, without any doubt, the light of each, to say, well, the light of this one stops here, and the light of that one starts here, it's impossible. The light generated by the ten lamps becomes one light that illumines the whole room. To distinguish without any doubt the light of each, when you turn your face toward their light is impossible. If you count a hundred apples or a hundred quinces, they do not remain a hundred, but they become one when you crush them and you make juice out of them. They've lost their, their, their numbers, their distinctiveness that which allows us to count them. Why? Because in things spiritual, there is no division, no numbers. In things spiritual, there is no partition and no individuals. Sweet is the oneness of the friend with his friends. Ettehadi yar bayaram khoshas. Catch the foot of the spirit. Get hold of some, even the lowest part of the spirit. Get hold of an understanding, a toehold in a spiritual vision. And on the other hand, get rid of this thing formed. Eliminate it if you are to have a proper opening to the spirit. Be careful because this form is stubborn and rebellious. It's the sweetness of the oneness of God, the friend, the Yah, with his friends, it's Yaran, that we now wish to address. Rumi tells us implicitly or explicitly, in verse after verse of the Masnavi, that what we need to have is a spiritual vision, as opposed to a vision dominated by form, by surah. If we have a vision fashioned by the Spirit, the essential meaning. This matna has all of these meanings. It's the most obvious is, uh, is to, if this means that, the ultimate intended meaning, the matna, but it comes from the essence or the spirit, the ultimate reality, the archetype, I might even say, as opposed to being fixated on form. If we have such a vision, fashioned by the spirit, we will see, to some extent, what Rumi sees. Understanding this distinction between matna and surat takes us to the heart of Rumi's message in the Nasnavi and to the heart of the meaning of sainthood in Islam. If we can see the spiritual essence through the veil of outward forms, we will see that the friend, God, is in fact one with his friends. 
Each saint enjoys a mystical communion with God, and by that fact, communion with all the other saints. But what is the meaning of this mystical union, the saintly communion? It's impossible to even <coughs> pretend to give a satisfactory verbal conceptual answer to that question. But what I hope to try and do is to give a preliminary and tentative response by reference to some of Rumi's extraordinary commentaries on a particular story in the Quran, the story of the Blessed Virgin, upon whom be peace. One of the many remarkable features of the Holy Quran is the way in which it recalls episodes from the Bible, but subtly alters them, sometimes radically transmutes them, in order to bring home a, a different spiritual teaching. The story of the virgin birth of Jesus is one such narrative. We see in its Quranic retelling a remarkable degree of attention to the Blessed Virgin. And this is striking on many counts, not least of which is the contrast that it affords with the relative paucity of detail that we find about the Blessed Virgin in the Gospels. The Quranic account of the Annunciation continues into her pregnancy and her role in presenting the baby Jesus, who speaks miraculously from the cradle. Now, we should note that Mary is the only woman who is named explicitly in the Quran. There's an entire chapter devoted to her, chapter 19, Surah Maryam. She's, quote, chosen and elevated among all of the women of all of the worlds, according to Surah number 3, Ali Imran, verse 42. It's not surprising, therefore, to see in the Masnavi and in all of, of Rumi's works a frequent retelling of the story or the mention of Mary and Jesus in his, um, in his teachings. There are two key features of Rumi's teachings on Mary and her son that we wish to focus on this evening. The first is based on the Quranic account of the Annunciation, which is given in chapter the chapter entitled Maria, which is number 19, verses 16 to 21. Relate in the scripture the story of Mary, when she withdrew from her family to an abode in the east. She secluded herself from her family. Then we sent her our spirit, Ruhana which transformed itself for her as the image of a perfect man. And I want us all to, to, to think about that. This is the Quran that's saying that the spirit transforms itself, tamathala laha, for her. The spirit undergoes a transmutation. And this is one of the aspects of the context that I want us to bear in mind as we go through and think about the subtlety of this Spirit of God that can transform itself by being absolutely faithful to itself, transforms itself into a form while in no way attaining a dereliction of its own essence. She said, I seek refuge from you in the All-Merciful, if you are God-fearing. He, the angel, said, I am but a messenger, a rasul, from your Lord, bestowing upon you the gift of a pure son. She said, how can I have a son, seeing that no man has touched me, and I am not unchaste? He said, it will be thus. Your Lord says, it is easy for me, and we shall make of him a revelation for mankind, a sign, an eye attending mass, and a mercy from us. And it is a thing ordained. The Rumi gives us an inspired poetic commentary on some of the inner dimensions of Mary's instinctive response to the angel. I seek refuge in you. In, I seek refuge in God from you, she says to the angel. And this is what Rumi says. Before, this is in the Masnavi, I go to yeah, book three, Nine, three, seven hundred, and it continues. Those three dots mean that I just do that one line, and then the others are three seven oh seven to three seven ten. Rumi says, "Before the slipping away of your possessions, 
Say to the form, whatever the form may be, whatever you're attached to, say to your form, your possession, what you're attached to, say to it, like Mary, I seek refuge from you with your merciful. Mary became selfless, bichod, and in her selfless, selflessness, she said, I will leap into the divine protection. Now Rumi explains why this happens. Because that pure bosomed one had made a habit of betaking herself in flight to the unseen, since she deemed the world a kingdom without permanence, she prudently made a fortress of that divine presence, in order that in the hour of death she should have a stronghold, which the enemy would find no way to attack. This is helping us to see the importance of having this habit, and I think I'll, I'll return to this in a moment, of prayer, of fleeing to the unseen, so that when you are face to face with a form that is a possible temptation, you can transform that temptation into an inspiration, to the extent that you go into your abode with God, your inner abode with that presence, that's the fortress that the enemy cannot assail at the moment of death when it will matter most. What we should note carefully here is that Mary's reaction is based on her habitual refusal to worship form. She's not a surat parast. And a deeply ingrained habit of true worship and prayer and invocation of God. Through her habit of prayer, she, quote, inhabited, and we have this in English very fortunately, when something becomes a habit, you inhabit that which you have a habit of going into, prayer. You inhabit the world of the unseen, the ghaib, the invisible realm, of the archetypes, in which the spiritual realities are to be found. One, only one, who is immersed in prayer is capable of having this spiritual reflex in the face of the temptations of outward phenomena. We're going to return shortly to this question of the invocation of the name of God as one of the key means by which we disentangle ourselves from worshipping forms into worshipping the essence. There's so many sayings of the Holy Prophet and so many verses of the Quran emphasise dhikrullah, the remembrance of God, the invocation of the name of God, as the afdal al-ibadah, the most excellent of all forms of worship. Just to continue for the moment, the angel discloses to Mary that he is a messenger from God, and she immediately sees that this form reveals, rather than conceals, the spirit. The angelic form is mysteriously rendered identical in its essence, or seen as being identical in its essence, with that merciful reality in whom she is seeking refuge. And this is how Rumi continues with this passage. The exemplar of bounty, referring back to the angel, cried out to her, I am the trusted messenger of the Lord, be not afraid of me. You are fleeing from my existence into non-existence. In non-existence I am a king, and standard bearer. Truly, my home and dwelling place is in non-existence. This is non-existence in the positive sense, that which is beyond existence. Solely my form is before the lady. I am the light of the Lord, like the true dawn, for no night prowls around my day. You are taking refuge from me with God, I am in eternity the image of the refuge. I am the refuge that was often your deliverance. You take refuge, and I myself am that refuge. There is no bane worse than ignorance. You are with, you are with your friend and do not know how to be in love. We return to the theme of the oneness of the friend and all of his friends, angels, prophets, saints. Rumi tells us here, however, that the only way in which we can see God as the true identity of the angel 
is by total self-effacement, what Emma referred to in her introduction. That is, becoming one with the non-existence whence the angel came, and with which the angel is one in its essence. The message again is that we need to transcend the world of appearances and forms. We need to enter into the supraformal world beyond existence, where the divine presence unifies all things. When this happens, we will see, in the words of the Quran, the face of God, which is there wherever we look. Verse um, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 115, wherever you turn, the Quran says, there is the face of God. In other words, if we have this vision, we will see that the infinitely variegated beauty of the face of the Beloved is shining through all of the phenomena in existence. And I can't help thinking of the great statement by the sister of Imam Hussein, Sayyidat Zainab, alayhi salam, when she was asked, so what happened at Karbala? Look what God did to your brother and your family. And she just simply replied, I saw nothing but beauty. That vision can only come by seeing through all of the phenomena of the world, even those which are most negative, and seeing through to the archetypes of which even negative phenomena are just negations of reality. That negation is what you see through in order to uh, make contact with the face of the Beloved in all phenomena, through all phenomena. Turning now to the second feature of Rumi's comments on the story of the Blessed Virgin, the birth pangs of Mary. He teaches us that without experiencing something akin to Mary's pain, the terrible pain that she experienced according to the Quran, the Jesus within our heart cannot be born. First, let's note again the Quranic context for this as part of the narrative. So, this is Surah Maryam again, Surah 19, verses 22 to 26. So she conceived him, and she retired with him to a remote place. And the agonies of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a palm tree. She cried, Woe to me! Would that I had died before this, and were a thing utterly forgotten. Very powerful words. Ya laytani mittu qabla hada wa kuntu nasyan mansiya. Then he cried to her from beneath her, he, Jesus, within, within her womb, or the angel beneath her, it's not clear, it can be either. Then he cried to her from beneath her, Grieve not, for your Lord has provided a rivulet beneath you. And shake towards yourself the trunk of the palm tree. It will let fall fresh ripe dates upon you. So eat and drink and cool your eyes. Ruby gives us a very, very powerful comment on this in his discourses. The book that's been in the Arabic, has an Arabic title, Kitab Fihi Ma Fihi, the book that contains what it contains. <coughs> and we'll just go to that slide now. And he tells us in this, these are uh, discourses that Rumi gave and they were written down and then he may have had a chance to um, slightly go over them and correct things. And they were uh, they were a kind of complement to his poetic works. So it's, this is prose. He says, It was not until the pains of parturition manifested in her that Mary made for the tree. Those pangs brought her to the tree, and the tree which was withered became fruitful. The body is like Mary. Every one of us has a Jesus within him. But until the pangs, the pains manifest in us, our Jesus is not born. If the pangs never come, then Jesus rejoins his origin by the same secret path by which he came, leaving us bereft and without any share in him. 
We might ask, why should such pain be necessary for the birth of the Spirit within us? One simple answer, based on Rumi's opening lines of Book 1, is that in order to experience the joy of union, we need intense fervour in our aspiration for union. And in order to feel fervent aspiration, we first have to feel the wretchedness of our present state of separation. Book one of the Masnavi opens with the lament of the reed flute, which longs to return to its bed of reeds. After telling us that the reed flute laments its separation from its homeland, Rumi cries out for someone whose heart is torn to shreds by their state of separation from God. Only such a one, he says, will be able to take this story that I have to tell. I want a bosom, he says. I want a bosom, a breast, torn by severance, by Ferrar, that I may unfold to such a person the pain of loving desire, Ishtiar. Everyone who is left far from his source wishes back the time when he was united with it. In the following passage, actually before I go on, just a, a point about this pain of separation. Um, there's a wonderful book called Naturalness by a, a Buddhist called Kenryo Kanamatsu. And he talks about the pain of being separated from that to which you are attached. And he says we have to put into force, into effect, this detachment from things of this world that we are attached to. Because if we don't, it will happen at death. And at death, the, the wrench, the, the uprooting, of our soul from the things that we're attached to will be as painful as being skinned alive. Your skin will be ripped from you because your soul will have attached itself to things of the world. And those things will no longer be there in the next world. So that is the pain of separation. That is the, the spiritual vision that we should have when we realize that we're we are surat paras, we are worshipping form, and we need to worship the essence. Otherwise, there's terrible pain and suffering in the story. In the following passage, from which I think is up there, yes, book five, we read one of the most beautiful descriptions of divine love. The balm for the soul that has felt its wretchedness has become fervent in its aspiration and is now being rewarded with at least an anticipation of celestial beatitude. In this passage from Book 5 of the Masnavi, we read one of the most beautiful descriptions of divine love, at the end of which is the inspiration. Remember, this word means the breathing in. The inspiration of the Spirit, making Mary pregnant with Jesus, showing us that the grievous pain of sacrifice is a foreshadowing of the glorious birth of the Spirit. Love is an ocean, he says. <coughs> Love is an ocean on which the heavens are a flake of foam. They are distraught like Zuleika in desire for a Joseph. Know that the wheeling heavens are turned by waves of love. One remembers Dante here, about the same time as we were. Were it not for love, the world would be frozen. How would an inorganic thing disappear into a plant? How would vegetative things sacrifice themselves to become spirit? And how would the spirit sacrifice itself for the sake of that breath, the spirit with a capital S, by the waft whereof a Mary was made pregnant? Very, very beautiful lines. At this point... Um, we, uh, in the 15 or 20 minutes we have left, I'm going to shift our perspective and explore the idea of the communion of friends through a brief look at what happened to Rumi when he encountered 
the great saint Shanti Tabriz. This is Rumi's mysterious guide and master, although Shams says that Maulana, our master, was Rumi. Um, and Rumi dedicated his vast corpus of his divan to Shams, the divan of Shams and Tabriz. According to Rumi's son, Sultan Valad, Rumi was transformed from an ascetic into an ecstatic. A sober, saintly teacher became a singing, dancing lover. In his poetic biography of his father, known as the Valad Name or the Abtadaname, he describes his father's state as follows. The music and dancing of remembrance, the Sama, became his creed, both true and straight. He had been a mufti, someone who can give fatwas. He had been a mufti, he became a poet. He had been an ascetic, he became intoxicated by love. But it was not the wine of the grape. The illumined soul drinks only the wine of light. It's as if, as if Rumi was struck by a bolt of sanctifying lightning flashing from the heart of Shams. He was, as it were, spiritually electrified, so that his life thereafter was dominated by poetry and song, music and dance, and in particular, of course, the whirling dance, the whirling remembrance taught to him by Shams. We should remember that as the Mevlevis are whirling, they are invoking the name Allah, which is the key methodic practice of the Mevlevis, the invocation of the divine name. So what happened in this encounter, in this communion of the two saints? Shams gives us a clue in his comment on the saying of the Prophet, In the days of your era, Ayana Dahrakon, your Lord has fragrant breaths, nafahat, perfumes, but has the idea of a, of, an, of a breathing out by God. So expose yourselves, open yourselves up to them. Shams tells us something about the meaning of these fragrant breaths in terms of emanations, he says, from the soul of one of the servants brought close to God, one of the muqarrabun. Again, we need a Quranic context for this to understand the distinction between the pious and the, those brought close, the saints. The, yes, here it is, the, the kimiyaya sa'ada. The emanations of the soul of one who has, has realized God, who has been brought close to God, who has the alchemy of felicity, Kimiai Sa'ada. And then he says, not that book, dismissively. As if say, not that text from 150 years ago by Ghazali, um, the great Al-Ghazali, who wrote two texts, one in Persian and one in Arabic, of that title, The Alchemy of Happiness. And I'm delighted to say that, that we know, we have a whole film on that subject, again by by a video who, which is called The Alchemist of Happiness. Wonderful feature, uh, documentary, but dramatized in parts about Al-Ghazali. And we should also remember, incidentally, that before this encounter with Shams, Rumi is about 38 years old. Rumi is regarded as the Al-Ghazali of his time. He was already regarded as a great saint. It was just that he was sober, he was a teacher, he gave... Uh, legal opinions and so on and so forth. What is it that catapulted this sober mystic who had already realized a degree of sanctity into this ecstatic mystic that has shared with us some of the fruits of his realization? So, Shams is helping us to see what's going on. What are these outbreaths, these fragrant outbreaths coming from God, but also from the servants because the friends are one with the friend. So, he says, not the book, that text, but I'm talking about the soul, the heart of a saint from which these breaths come directly from God, mediated by these saints. 
For if you put one atom of this alchemy, meaning the alchemical transformation of a, of a heart, if you put one atom of this alchemy on a hundred million rooms full of copper, in other words, nothing to do with any physical transformation, it would become pure gold. This is a spiritual alchemical transformation. And we should also remember now, in terms of understanding the context of this extraordinary instantaneous transformation of Rumiya from the touch, the contact with Shams. We should remember three key things about his context. First of all, doctrine. What was, what was the doctrine that Rumi had and that already made him the Al-Ghazali of his time? He had the whole doctrine of Islamic spirituality, but in particular, that whole tradition of Islamic spirituality <laughs> was doctrinally synthesized by an extremely important text, his father's own Ma'arif, plural of Ma'arifa, spiritual wisdom. This text was something that Rumi was told to read again and again and again from beginning to end, hundreds of pages, by his first master, who was Bahadin Walad's chief disciple. Bahadin Walad was... Uh, about 80 years old when he passed away and he told his leading disciple Burhan bin Muhakkak to take over the training the spiritual training of Rumi and for about 9 years Rumi was under the tutelage of Burhan bin Muhakkak and Burhan bin told him read this text in addition to the Quran and everything else but read your father's text again and again and again because of the extraordinary power spiritual energy that God gave to Bahadin Walad in this text. And we've been very privileged in the last six weeks or so to read this text with one of my colleagues, I think is here, Rahim Holami at the Institute. Um, and we are beginning to understand why it was that this was the text that apparently Rumi read a thousand times from cover to cover in the space of nine years. Now, the other key aspect of the context to understand what made Rumi what he was in terms of such heightened receptivity to this perfume of spirituality that was going to act like an elixir on his heart, transforming his consciousness so uh, in such an extraordinary way. The other key thing is, what I mentioned earlier, the remembrance of the name of God, the invocation of the name of God. Rumi was an ascetic. He became an ecstatic. But what does it mean to say an ascetic? It means that he fasted and he went in for long retreats that we could not even do a 90th of, let's say. Why? Because he did three sets of 30-day halwas, 30-day retreats. Um, it could have been 40 days, but we'll, you know, it's three sets of those. And at, at the end of each, Burhanuddin would come and see that Rumi's still in a state of deep meditation. He's not moving. What is he doing? in this itself, often locked, very little light coming in, it's a kind of sensory deprivation, total focus on the name Allah, with the only other thing that you're doing the five daily prayers. That's it. For 30 days, 30 days, 30 days. So, let's remember that. And the third thing we should remember is what Shams emphasizes in an extraordinary way in his maqalat, his discourses, which were he never wrote anything himself. But things that he had said in the company of Rumi and his disciples was sometimes written down, and those have come down through the generations, known as the discourses of Shams. And William Chittick has done a partial translation, Me and Rumi, it's entitled. What does Rumi emphasize again and again about the difference between Rumi, Maulana, and all the other sheikhs that he's seen in Damascus and here and there? One thing again and again he emphasizes. Rumi's humility. It's the only one amongst all these people I've met who have this tremendous knowledge, wonderful sanctity, but they're all too full of themselves. Rumi is empty of himself. He has this extraordinary humility. Sham says, sometimes when I speak to Rumi, I think I'm talking to a four-year-old child, the way he looks at me and listens to me. That was the humility, the receptivity, the recognition that this man has come as an angelic apparition to me. Total submission to a man of God. 
that was part of the context that made me so receptive to this transformation from one degree of sober sanctity to another degree, much higher, in which he just was told, if you like, by God, now is the time to share with the whole world your ecstasy through poetry, through dance, through the invitation. Now is the time to share it with the whole world. And you will do it best by giving all of these people a taste of paradise. The prophet, again, is a very important part of the context. The prophet said about this aspect of character, of humility at its core, without which no other virtue will be possible in the song. The prophet said, I was only sent to you as a prophet in order to make perfect for you, make complete for you, the noble traits of character. That's an absolutely vital part of understanding the context, what it was that made me mean. Maulana. Now, one notion that we could use in order to help us to understand what happened to Rumi is that of the aesthetic shock. It's a Pali word used in the Pali canon of Buddhism, samvega. And it expresses well the kind of transformation which Rumi experienced in his encounter with Shaks. The great scholar of the last century, Ananda Kumaraswamy, helps us to understand the meaning of this aesthetic shock when he tells us that it involves being shaken to the core of our being in our encounter with beauty. The result of this encounter with beauty is that one tastes beauty. Using that, his Kumar Swami is encouraging us to think of the word volk in Arabic, which the Sufis say is taste that, that we have. It's a taste of these realities that we have, not just a thought. One is existentially or even explosively penetrated by the beauty of a reality which previously was only a concept or a sentiment. The prophet said, the famous saying, God is beautiful and he loves beauty. In Allah Jamil and Yuhibbul Jamal. This is at one with the Platonic dictum, beauty is the splendor of the true. So let's return to this question of context. Many in the West might think, upon seeing the whirling dervishes, this has nothing to do with Islam. It suffices to refer to one saying of the Prophet to see how false that impression is. And this is a saying that is not one of the weak hadiths that the Sufis would use and that the scholars of hadiths would say, oh no, no, that's that the Prophet knows. It's a strongly authenticated hadith. This one hadith shows us how this whirling is actually in keeping with the spirit of Islam even if it might shock many narrow-minded Muslims. So I think, yeah, they've got that here. He who shakes not with awe at the remembrance of the beloved. Sorry, it's not awe. It's, it should just be he who shakes not with the remembrance of the beloved. That's not a state there. Well, you, could, you could put it in square brackets. He who shakes not with awe at the remembrance of the beloved has no beloved. Man lam yahazza the dhikr al-habib laysa lahu al-habib. Moreover, the Quran tells us in chapter 39, verse 23, that those who are truly in awe of their Lord will find their very skins shaking when they hear the Quran. Taqshayarru min hu juludu ladina yakshanda rabbam. It goes on to say that passage that Thumma Talinu Juluduhu Mahulubuhum Iladikla. Then their skins and their hearts become gentle and yield and soften to the remembrance of God. As regards this aesthetic shock, some Vega, Kumar Swami writes that when the spiritual of experience of beauty results in a true taste. He says, quote, 
Uh, I'm not sure I've got this up on the screen. No. He says, this taste is the very twin brother of the tasting of God. He says it involves a self-naughting, self-effacement. And he gives this Latin phrase from St. Bernard in his treatise on the love of God. Sempetipsa liquescere, a melting away of one's very self. And that, St. Bernard says, is the prerequisite for deificatio, deification. This tasting of a celestial beauty is virtually identical to tasting God. Why? Because, as Fritjof Schuon says, the greatest metaphysician and philosopher of the last century, in one of his many illuminating books, Logic and Transcendence, page 147, he says, the garden, the garden of paradise, is above all a plane of reverberation of the divine beauty. Every paradisal phenomenon transmits the divine substance. So a taste of paradise is a taste of the divine substance, a taste of God. Only when the spiritual, only when the individual is spiritually effaced can God be revealed as the reality subsisting within him. Now, I noticed that we're running out of time, so I'm actually going to speed things up a little bit. It's, uh, we have about five minutes? No, it's fine. No, no, it's absolutely, we have the moment for a long time. Oh, well, uh, I may be running out of steam then. <laughs> if we're not running out of time, I'm running out of steam. Um, at this point, the following question may be posed. <clears throat> I'll just take a drink of water. At this point, we might pose the following question. How can one be a friend of God? How can there be a multiplicity of friends? How can there be a communion of saints? If the prerequisite for this friendship, for this sanctity, is knowledge of one's nothingness, does friendship not imply duality? I am your friend, you are my friend, we are two. And yet we're told repeatedly, you're not going to get anywhere near this kind of friendship with God unless you realise that you are nothing, unless you've entered into this complete fana. And on the basis of fana, annihilation, extinction, various way, words we could use to translate this term. But once you are annihilated from egocentricity, not simply from your ego, the ego subsists, Rumi and Shams carried on living as individual beings with egos, but their ego, their, their consciousness was not dominated by their ego, such as to make that consciousness egocentric. So, how does this work? You have to be self-effaced, you have to realise you're nothing before God, and then you can become a friend of God. We would look in vain for a kind of logical resolution of this sort of paradox in the Masnavi. Instead, the Masnavi helps us to see this apparent contradiction as a creative paradox. And it does so not through logical exposition, but through poetic intimation, mystical allusion, narrative implication, musical inebriation, and visionary evocation. Through these powerful means of communication, what we are offered through the Masnavi is what can be properly called, I believe, a theurgy, something theurgic. It's something that makes present the divine energy that can transform your consciousness, making you present, making you aware of the perpetual, perpetually renewed moment of existence in which God is always present. This divine energy opens up the heart to the love, to the beauty and the beatitude. 
pulsating from the heart of God. It is as if the Mass Nabi gives us access to the fountain of San Sabir, which he mentions in his preface um, when he talks about, as I said, this Arabic preface where he, um, he describes the Mass Nabi as if he's talking about the Quran. Appear to be very scandalous. But what he's actually doing is saying that this Masnavi has nothing to do with me. I am as empty as the reed flute, as Emma was saying earlier. I am like the reed flute, and what is blown through me, that breath of God, that fragrant breath of God, is what causes these celestial melodies to come into poetic mode for you all. I have nothing to do with it. So this one of the ways in which he describes the Mass is it is like the fountain of San Sabil, one of the celestial fountains from which you drink. Allowing us to have a sip from that fountain. This is what the Mass Navi does. It gives us this incredible privilege, especially if we can read it in Persian. We sip from the fountain of paradise and we become thereby infused to some extent with the intuitions of the joy-imparting realities of that paradise, of the muse, whence come the Masnavi itself. If, even if we are not all given the grace of these celestial intuitions, most of us do receive some kind of experience in reading with me, even in translation. We experience some kind of recognition of a home where we have always lived prior to coming into this world, and one to which we will return after death. This happiness, therefore, is deepened when this nostalgic recognition is joined to imaginative anticipation, an anticipation of our return to our true home in the heavenly garden, which is identical with our own heart. And this is where we come to an extremely important saying of, the, of, of God, on the tongue of the Prophet, a Hadith Qudsi, and he says that the heaven, that the earth has no room to contain me, the heaven can't contain me, God speaking, but the heart of my believing slave has room to contain me. Rumi spends a great deal, oh, we haven't done halaj, but uh, should we just, just move along? <laughs> Sorry about that. We can come back to that in the questions if you want, but I, I think now that I'm on this. Uh, I've got a bit lost on the break. Um, Rumi spends a lot of time on this one saying, what does it mean to say that God is contained in the heart of the believer, but it is not contained in the vast expanse of this world, of this universe, and of the heavens. We haven't got time to go into the, the verse, there are many, many verses on this, based on this, uh, commenting on this hadith. But let's return to um, well, let's go to the conclusion now. We've been over an hour, so let's Go back to this question of um, the kind of love that we have to have in order to be burnt. Um, I was reminded just, just a moment ago by a video that one of the great lines in the Masavi is, I was raw, then I was cooked, then I was burnt. This sums up a great deal of what Rumi's inviting us to participate in. This burning up of our egotistic passions and desires. In story after story, teaching after teaching, the Masnavi reveals to us the follies, the strategies, the deceptions and the games of the ego. The ego that's always desperately trying to assert its reality, affirm its identity, uphold its glory. Against this background of illusion and deception, we see standing out in the Mass Navi again and again and again, with dazzling clarity and beauty, the true reality of God, Al-Haq. 
But to have the spiritual vision of beauty, as opposed to what Rumi calls in this in these lines, an ideal passion, which most of us unfortunately have, not true love of God, we have an ideal passion. We need to love God with all our being. And we can only love God with all our being when our egocentric existence is consumed in the fire of the love that we have for God. And if we find that our egocentric instincts and desires and deceptions and follies and games is not being burnt up, we have to admit to ourselves that what we have for God is not so much true love that's burning up our egotism day by day in greater holy war, but we actually have an idle passion, an occasional thought of God, an occasional desire to conform to God. And that is not good enough for Rumi. If there be any spectacle, any tamashai, anything that you're looking at, anything that takes your fancy, anything that actually distracts you, accept God as the beloved, the ma'ashul. It is not love. It's an idle passion. Love is that flame which, when it blazes up, consumes everything else except the beloved. Book 5, 587-588. Five, eight, eight. Now, I'll let Rumi have the final word. Um, and it brings us back to a mystery which he can point to, allude to, hint at, intimate better than any of us. The mystery of what is left of us when we are completely burnt up in the fire of love, so that the fire of the beloved alone remains. We will understand how this comment that we've got up on the screen, we will understand how this comment on the Quranic verse relates to the theme of our communion of the saints, and how this relates in turn to the mystery of all mysteries, union with God. What does that mean, unio mystica? Tawheed in the deepest mystical sense. We will understand this if we bear in mind what we learned from Ruby earlier. The prophets as representatives or spokespersons of God are not different in their essence from that which they represent. Here is their comment, here is, sorry, Rumi's comment on this verse, which is, Truly there had come unto you a prophet from yourselves. akun. Rasulun min and fusikon. Outwardly, formally, it means that a prophet has come from your community, from yourselves. One of you, you know him, he knows you. But esoterically, it means what one of the things it means is what Rumi is telling us here. Rumi shows us that the prophet <coughs> is revealing to us nothing other than our true selves. As we once were in paradise, and as we can become once again by the grace of God, inshallah. So this is the comment, and we'll, we'll just read this, and, and we will stop with the repetition of the verse, as Rumi has it at the, uh, the bottom of, of this passage. In the composition of man, all sciences, all knowledge were originally commingled the names that God taught Adam. Through Adam, each and every one of us. We were taught the knowledge of all things in our pre-existential state before we came into this world. It's very platonic. Knowledge is all about anamnesis, undoing of forgetfulness. The all knowledge was commingled within Adam's spirit so that it might show forth all hidden things. Everything will be clear to Adam. Just as limpid water, clear and transparent water, shows forth all that is under it and all that is above it, reflected in the substance of the water. All knowledge is in our heart, just as the heart is a mirror that is polished by the name of God, such that it can receive perfect clarity and reflect with perfect fidelity all knowledge that it receives from all things above it. Such is its nature, without treatment or training. This is the inherent nature of the human heart. 
But when it was mingled with earth and other colours, when it falls into this lower domain, that property and that knowledge was parted from it and forgotten by it. Insan in Arabic means both the human being and it comes from nasya as well as uns. Uns means intimacy and nasya means to forget. So it's both nisyan and uns. Man is made up of this intimacy that comes from knowledge that's innate within him, but in his fallen state, it's forgotten. That knowledge was parted from the spirit and forgotten by it. Then God, Most High, sent forth prophets and saints, like a great limpid water, such as delivers out of darkness and out of accidental coloration every mean and dark water that enters into it. This is the lustral water, as the sages of India say, that there is no lustral water like unto knowledge. It's exactly what Rumi is saying, that this pure and purifying water of the prophets and the friends purifies us of all of this, um, the, this dirt that has gotten into our own water. Then it remembers, and we see the prophets and the saints, then the human being remembers. When the soul of man sees itself unsullied, when it sees itself in its original purity, outwardly manifested by the prophets and the saints, it knows for sure that so it was in the beginning, pure. And it knows that those shadows and colours were mere accidents, that were not part of his real substance. Remembering its state, before those accidents intervened, it says, this is that sustenance which we were provided with before, quoting the Quran, verse 25 of the Surah Al-Baqarah, number 2, which is what the people in paradise say when they're given to eat of the fruits of paradise, they say, this is what we were made to eat before. In other words, on earth. There's an identity of essence that links the paradisal experience of truth and beauty on earth with the experience of truth and beauty in heaven. The prophets and the saints therefore remind him of his former state. They, the prophets and the saints, do not implant anything new in his substance. This reminds me very much of Meister Eckhart and what he says about Jesus. Eckhart says that what God gave Jesus, he gave me and he gave you and every person. And I exclude nothing, he says, neither holiness, holiness nor justice. They do not implant anything new in its substance. Now every dark water that recognises that great water, us, our dark little rivulets or streams or ponds full of impurities, when we see these oceans of purity that are outwardly manifested by the forms of the prophets and the saints, every dark water that recognises that great water says... I come from this, and I belong to this. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We can hear as a Quranic echo here. We, have, we belong to God, and to God we are always returning. I come from this, and I belong to this. And he mingles with that. Every dark water will mingle with that water, become purified by it. And it was on this account that God declared, Truly, there had come unto your prophet from yourselves. Surah at Toba, verse 128. And I'll, I'll stop there. And I think we have time for about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Is that right? Oh, thank you very much.